All right, you're very welcome along to season two of Leaders' Questions with Stuart Lancaster. It's our leadership series here, brought to you by Off the Ball. Over the course of the next seven weeks or so, we're going to speak with some of the brightest minds from different areas around the world in sport and business. Some examples, Kevin Sinfield, who is Leeds Rhinos Director of Rugby, a legendary player himself. We'll also speak with Ronan O'Gara, uh, recorded during his time at Crusaders and before he actually got the head coaching job at La Rochelle. Anna O'Leary, the Vodafone CEO, um, also going to talk to us about her own career and how she ended up at the helm of one of the biggest companies in the country and in particular why they're interested in uh, getting involved in sports sponsorship. Loads more as well to come. Our first episode this week is with Stuart Lancaster himself. He talks about how personal loss has managed to shape his own leadership style, his time at Leinster and loads more besides. It's a, an evolution from season one. I hope you enjoy it. We certainly enjoyed recording these episodes over the last four or five months and we hope you enjoy them over the next six or seven weeks. Enjoy. Leaders' Questions with Stuart Lancaster on Off The Ball. And you're very welcome along to season two of Leaders' Questions with Stuart Lancaster. Uh, we've made it to a second season. This is, this is supposed to be the difficult second album, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm pleased we've actually made it to the second, uh, second series, first of all. Um, no, delighted uh, with the feedback on the first you know, group of leadership talks we had. Um, Lots of people kept stopping me saying, you know, I really like this. And, and there was, you know, a little bit I think people took out of every, every guest we had. So, you know, pleased to go for part two. Tell us a little bit about um, what you get out of stuff like this. Because I think that was kind of what struck me from the first season was that you are continuously open to learning as opposed to uh, here I am coming down from Mount Sinai with the tablets. It's like I'm actually at the bottom of the Mount Sinai reading what's on the tablets and trying to, trying to distill stuff. So when, when we were talking to those, was there stuff that struck you in the aftermath and when you were listening back going, oh yeah, okay, that's actually a good point. Yeah, I mean, obviously I was lucky in that the, the people we spoke to, I, I knew their, their backstory really. So I think what really motivated me or motivates me is sharing the, the learning and sharing, you know, the content or the knowledge that um, the guests we had, you know, uh, to, the, to a wider audience, you know, and because of the, um, the beauty of social media and everything else, it wasn't just, you know, through the radio, was it? You know, people, a lot of people got in contact and listening on different forums. So, um, so for me, it was, the, it was the sharing of my knowledge that I'd learned and the sharing of like Owen Eastwood's knowledge or Bill Bezik's knowledge or Caroline Lennon, or, you know, all the people that we spoke to. Um, and I think um, the people who I bumped into afterwards, um, I think that they, they took little pieces from what I'd said and little things from what someone else had said. Uh, and that's rewarding, really rewarding that you can pass on what you've learned. You know, it's, I guess it goes back to being the teacher. It's the teacher in me. So you want to, you know, you want to pass on what you've learned or, you know, to, to pupils. And uh, it, feels, it feels like that, you know, in, in terms of leadership. Um, so I love coach education, you know, I'd be a big supporter of coach education, um, uh, where, whether I'm passing on what I've learned as a defensive coach or an attacking coach or as a head coach, um, or whether it's leadership. So, and this, you know, it's a pretty unique um, series that we did, I think. I don't think anyone else has done it. Um, and I think it's been, um, yeah, really good, really good to do. How much time do you have for that in the day job at the moment, uh, that passing on of... of um of information and knowledge and, and how to as opposed to the nuts and bolts of what the game plan is for this week? Uh, it's a lot more than you think. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously, say a typical typical week this week. Um, so we uh, we would obviously, obviously review the game from the weekend, but before the game I'd probably review the, the games that have just happened over the Six Nations games that happened over the weekend. Um, I would talk about maybe some things I've seen in Super Rugby. Uh, I'd maybe find something on a, a leadership podcast and I'd put that out on the WhatsApp group to the players. Um, so always trying to to pass on little little nuggets to the players to help them become better leaders themselves. And obviously in between times, because I'm in Dublin, my family are in Leeds and I'm on my own, you know, uh, I've got evenings on my own or whatever. You know, it's, it's a Friday game and we've got no training to take place on the day of the game. You know, I'll use those moments to try and read the next book or reflect on the next thing. Um, so, yeah, I've got the time and the capacity, um, and I certainly see the job as part, um, uh, part as education of the players from a rugby tactical point of view, but also part education on leadership and, uh, because ultimately the players need to drive, yeah, to, to drive the, the performance on the field anyway, but ultimately, I, I ultimately want them to go and be successful in life anyway, so beyond, um, do they, their careers. do they get that? Do they understand that? Because I'm, I'm always, you know, 
a lot of people, particularly in a professional sports environment, are in an amazing. Uh, they have an amazing opportunity, but I mean, frequently it's at the end of it you go, "Oh, look at all that free time I had." They do. They do. They do now because I talk about it all the time to them. So, I, so I basically say, you know, I want to pass on what I've le- what I learned when I was thirty five and I finished my career to you when you're twenty five, and they go, mm, "Yeah, there's probably some sense in that. Let's have a listen to some of the stuff that we've been talked about here." Um, so. Um, not all, not all are like that, but I would say the majority are. Certainly Leinster, who I've come across, the, the keen to learn, keen to improve. They can improve as a leader and as a player, uh, both on and off the field. Um, I would say 100% of the players w- would want to do that. Is this, uh, this uh, that other aspect, the kind of vocational aspect of the job? Because, I mean, professional sport, again, it's very cutthroat. You've got to win games, and if you don't win games, then there are uh, repercussions. Um, that vocational side of it, is that something that you will always bake into whatever role you have in future? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, you know, Leo's got the head coaching job, so he's got other things that take his time away from doing the things that I do. You know, so he's got to, you know, select the teams, go around and speak to the players about selection and everything else. And it frees me up to maybe have more one-to-one time with the players. When I was in Leo's role with England, obviously, um, you're more managing leadership, managing up, you're managing the board, you're managing, you know, other things. So um, I've certainly got the time now to help the players and... Uh, um, I see it as a big part of the job, huge part of the job. Are you getting better at it? Um, I probably need to uh, um, do more, actually. That's probably the bit I need to be better at, is, is, is do more of it. You know, I, I constantly have to remind myself to have the small conversations with players. You know, it's very easy to get stuck behind your laptop and, and analysing games and watching the next opposition. Um, you know, even yesterday, three conversations happened within the space of, say, ten minutes. There was one with a, uh, a player who's just... Fought, uh, fought his way into the first team uh, and I felt he wasn't quite um, believing in himself. So I pulled him to one side and we had a conversation two weeks ago and he played much, much better over the last two weeks. Uh, and then I wanted to reinforce the fact that I thought he'd played better and the reason why and how he was now asking for the ball and he was you know, showing more confidence and belief in his own ability. And I asked him why he felt improving performance as well because you, you reminded me of, you know, gave me the confidence to do it. Um, so that was one example, and then yesterday there were also two examples on the training field where there were two young players who both of them just made their debuts for Leinster. And I said, just come over, to, how, how do you think you went to the weekend? Give me a score uh, out of ten, seven, so what would it have been eight? Okay, so how, how do you think you went from a tactical point of view? Yeah, I think this. And what do you think about your leadership? How do you think you led? I mean, this is, these are scrum halves, so these are, you know, the fulcrum of the team, but actually they're only like 21 years old, so it's very difficult for them to start bossing everyone around. But I said, mm. I need you to do that because that's what the position requires. So, so you know, I could easily have drifted through that training session and not had those conversations and not tried to at least, you know, touch, touch on them um, some form of leadership, support or yeah, intervention. Yeah, the, it'll be grand. We'll get through this. I'll get to that later, and then it doesn't happen. And exactly. the next game happens. Exactly. And, like, and you miss all those little conversations. And once you have those conversations, um, I think it was John Gordon who we spoke to. You know. Um, uh, communicate to connect to commit. So you communicate and then you create that connection because they feel valued because you've spent time with them, you've had the one-to-one conversation. And the one-to-one conversation often can broaden out from how do you think you played the weekend to uh, how's your degree going or what's yeah. going on at home or what do you think of the guy that came in to speak to us the other day and what did you take from that? Um, and then you get that connection um, and then um, you get the commitment. So you get the, the buy-in between the two of you because he feels he cares for me you know, I want to repay him because I want to play well because, you know, it's uh, he's trying to help me get better. Is this something you've got better at then over your career? Yeah, I think I was always naturally inclined to do it. I think I go back again to the teaching. So the teacher in you is you're, you're wanting to help people learn. Um, and uh, I had no... I actually enjoyed teaching all the grades of the students, if you like. So if, you, if you know, you've got the really intelligent ones... Um, and the, the, maybe the sporty ones, but also the ones who maybe struggle academically, um, or the ones who are less uh, inclined to to, be, to want to be um, involved in sport. Um, I, I, I know ABC of importance to me. I just enjoyed trying to help each one of them get better, and it was actually as rewarding, more rewarding sometimes, for the kids who were just about to go off the track and you know start truanting and you know go down a path of you know trouble um, to try and get them back on the right path, and and you know to maybe they didn't achieve. A grade A, B, or C at GCSE, but but they got a D, which was actually the highest grade they got, um, and it was in the subject that I taught. And but also, you would spend time in the lesson, 
you know, particularly with the, some of the kids who are in the, the bottom sets, um, you'd spend a bit of time talking about whatever it was, you know, heart, the heart and lungs in GCSEP or muscles or whatever else. And then you'd stop and say, right, so what are we doing this weekend? And do you see the game at the weekend? And, and you, you're trying to then use real life stories and trying to shape their mindset about where you want to help them take their life. So when that's been put inside you um, and the desire to want to educate people, and you do it for then 10 years of your life between 20 and 30, it just stays with you, you know what I mean? So, and actually the more um, knowledge that you acquire yourself, the more you want to pass it on. Um, you're a teacher, Joe Schmidt was a teacher, Graham Henry was a teacher. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. And yes, I'm, I'm wondering now that if you guys went into a professional rugby environment, the likelihood is that you would just go straight into coaching, like that, and that you wouldn't have that real life experience. Um, can you cheat that? Like if, if somebody is leaving the professional game now and is becoming an assistant academy coach or an academy coach or, you know, getting catapulted into a backs coaching role, um, they don't have that same understanding. Uh, there's a couple of issues, I think, that, that tend to emerge with players who go straight into coaching is, particularly because they've, they've only ever been in a professional environment, is, you know, obviously they've never had to really work out the problems for themselves, they've always been given to them because they've been a player and they've been on the receiving end of coaching. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Two, they, they almost assume that um, all the players that they're coaching should not have the knowledge that they have, um, or they, they are um, great players uh, who, who just assume, like I say, that everyone, everyone has the technical knowledge. So um, they struggle then with players who have less, of lesser ability. Um, and the third is they don't really invest any time into the... Um, aspects of coaching or teaching, the organisation of the session, how you communicate, you know, how you do re conduct a review. They know this on the technical side of the game. I had a very interesting conversation with Paul O'Connell about this, and uh, he's obviously coaching now, um, having been a player, and he said that's the biggest thing he needs to work on. It's not the technical side of the game, you know, the line-outs and everything else, he's got that inside out, but it's the communication, and obviously he's trying to do that in France as well, yeah. so he's making it doubly difficult for himself. Um, but um, fair play to him from doing it. Uh, but there are exceptions to the rule. There are players who I've come across who, um, who are unbelievably proactive, particularly towards the latter end of their career in terms of learning those skills so they can go into a successful leadership and coaching role um, once they finish playing. I mean, I met um, Johnny Cooper. I mean, he, he's been to Leinster. Um, I did a talk at the Pendulum Summit. He was sat there with me. He's making notes. He's got, you know, he's done... He's quite amazing person really in terms of I've not met many people like him who are so dedicated to wanting to be get better as a leader whilst he's still a player yeah why do you think some players have that like why do you think some that penny drops at some players um, I think I think obviously they have a and not everyone has this burning desire to want to be a coach uh, or to be to go into it so I think there has to be a passion inside them where they they feel that they want to go into some form of coaching whether it's back into a school as a teacher, whether it's back into an academy as an academy coach or whether it's back into the senior grade. Some people don't want to look at the life of a coach and think, you know, I don't fancy that lifestyle, you know, that looks pretty tough and unrelenting and, um, you know, your, your future is decided by a group of players you've got no control over, you know, ultimately when the game starts. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, so those, those, um, those players who have that inside them, they, they genuinely... Or they usually are proactive towards the end of their careers to try and begin that process. Um, the ones that really struggle, I think, are the ones who get to the end of their career and think, right, I might try coaching now. Yeah. And, you know, it's just not that easy. It's, it's just not that simple. No, it's an accidental thing yeah. as opposed yeah. to... And that. there's not that many jobs, to be honest. Um, so, you know, you've got to be prepared to start the bottom and work your way up. Yeah. Um, whereas you've usually been at the top as a player. You mentioned the, the Pendulum Summit there. Your talk was the pursuit of excellence. Is it worth it? How, why did you pick that topic? Um, so, obviously it was a big, it's a big event, the Pendulum Summit. And um, Frankie, she and contacted me and said, you know, would you like to speak? And initially the contact was about, um, do you want to sit on a panel? And I struggled a little bit with panels because um, obviously there's a couple of things that can happen. One, if the moderator who's asking the questions asks doesn't ask the right questions, you can't get, give the insight you want to give. Uh, and number two, if there's two or three people on the panel, then obviously, you know, you've got to wait your turn to speak, and you don't want to be jumping across people, so you can't often get your point across. 
So when I went back to him, I said, listen, I'm happy to go, I'd rather go myself and then just present so I'm in control of what I deliver. And I appreciate, you know, with 3,000 people in the audience, I can't take questions, but that's actually the best bit, you know, taking the questions. So when he agreed to that and then um, he put the schedule together, um, I was on second. Um, so there's an American graffiti artist, um, Eric Wall, on before me, who did this, like, amazing like set for an hour on creative leadership and I'm starting to think jeez <laughs> got to take some following um, and uh, but I've been thinking long and hard about what would I want if I was sat in the audience and I've been to a lot of leadership conferences and the ones I uh, really enjoy the ones where I can some take home messages for me that are real life and are going to help me become a better yeah. leader so so once I decided on the sort of um, the content um uh, I then started thinking about uh, some of the challenges that have come my way as a leader. And I, I based the first um, question around, is it worth it? Because of, obviously, you know, I, I took on a very difficult leadership challenge with England. I felt I made a lot of good decisions. Obviously, there's some decisions I, I would have done differently um, in hindsight. But um, by and large, I felt I made a lot of good decisions. But ultimately, I lost my job and I caused a lot of pain for everyone around me. Um, and the other thing that happened um, since we last spoke, my dad passed, uh, passed away in uh, September. So at the start of this season, um, we were um, just about to play um, our first league game for Leinster. And um, uh, I got a phone call. I got back in from training. Five missed calls from my brother. And I knew that wasn't... He would never ring. And um, uh, dad had had a cardiac arrest on the farm. And uh, uh, my mum had um, amazingly kept him alive until the ambulance came. It's quite a rural farm in Cumbria, so it took ages for the ambulance to come. Um, anyway, they, they got his heart started, but um, uh, obviously they sedated him, and I flew back from Dublin to, to, um, to Carlisle, or to Leeds, and then to Carlisle, uh, drove to Carlisle. And um, you know, after sedation, they, they were waiting for him to see if he would respond you know, once the drugs had worn off. And uh, unfortunately, although his heart and lungs responded, the damage to his brain from the lack of oxygen caused um, permanent brain damage. So he's, he was basically brain dead, unfortunately. And then, um, so we had to make the heartbreaking decision to turn off the machine. Uh, and so um, on the 3rd of September, um, he passed away. And, um, and I, I kept, when I was doing the Page of Summit talk, this is obviously January now, um, I kept thinking about the times, um, memories I've missed with my parents or my kids or whatever, because I'm trying to pursue excellence. You know, I'm trying to be the best leader I can be, they're trying to be the best coach I can be, trying to go on the, every leadership course I can, trying to, you know, commit everything to improve the organisation I'm working for at the expense of your family, your friends, your mum, your dad, or whatever. So that was the question to the audience, and I started with the two stories. I showed a picture of um, uh, my uh, exit from England. The second picture, I showed a picture of my dad. Uh, and my mum at the Pro 14 final um, with the trophy. And uh, it certainly took the audience by surprise, because I think obviously they've been used to the American graffiti artists, and suddenly I'm there talking about some pretty real-life stuff for me. Um, and the answer to the question was, of course it's worth it, because my dad wouldn't have wanted anything else, you know, and I would never have not wanted to take the England job. Uh, but I did say, and I, so I then, then through, I said, listen, of course it's worth it. I said, but you've got to make sure also you get the balance. You know, you must get the balance in your life. You know, if you're in a leadership position, we're all here because we want to be better leaders. But you must get the balance in your life as well. And you must make sure you give time to your family and to your friends and, you know, make those memories that are important for everyone. Um, but if you do want to pursue excellence, here, is, here are my top ten tips for, for pursuing excellence. So I went through the top ten and then I said, and I finished with, you know, whatever the tenth was. Um, and I went back to the, uh, the slides and I, and I said, you know, my dad was proud of everything I did and... Um, uh, it is worth it, but get the balance right. That's, that was that was just the, the talk. It was tough. Yeah, I'd uh, say so. Yeah, in front of. I'm sure. I, I didn't realize that your, your dad had passed away, and I'm sorry to hear that. Um, how did you deal with that? What like? Cause that, that week. Well, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I mean. I mean, obviously, it never, it's never really uh, happened um, in, my, in my life. Too. Obviously, my um, grandparents died, um, but no one as close to me. I mean, I mean he was fit and well. He was fit and well um, the day before. You know, he was fine. I spoke to him. He was going you know, to come to um, watch my son play. Um, and, uh, 
the next day, you know, it happened. And, and I, I didn't understand, actually, the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is your heart just goes and stops. Right. Um, heart, heart attack is more, you know, artery gets blocked and, yeah. It slows down. And yeah, just tightness in your chest yeah, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So, cardiac arrest, if it's outside, if you're not in a hospital, then, you know, your, your chances of survival are very, very slim, really, because the, the oxygen thing. Um, so, so we went through this period of, obviously, um, is he is he is he going to be able to survive? Is he going to survive? Do we want to keep? Does he, do we keep him alive in the state he's in? You know, and he was he wouldn't have wanted it. He wouldn't have wanted what he was in. But how then do you make that decision? Yeah. You know, there's me, my older brother, my sister, my younger brother, my mum, my kids who are devoted to him, um, my wife, their kids. You know, just just such a big thing in your life, and uh, and ultimately, you know, it took. And my mum wouldn't leave his side, you know, it took probably from switching off the support to him passing about five days, and it was, you know, horrific, really horrific. But then, obviously, you go through the, and this is a really interesting insight into um, the difference between Ireland and the UK. So in the UK, so in Ireland, you know, the funeral comes, and it happens almost within two days, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, and yeah. Um, we can't really understand what happens in England, it doesn't well, make it was, sense. Well, it was, it, was, it was two months, two weeks. It was two weeks, so it was the 17th of um, September um, when the funeral was. And, um, but the support I received from the people who knew, well, everyone knew at Leinster, was incredible. And, you know, when I said, listen, I can't, I can't come in for this period here, um, but I will be back for this because my dad would want me to come back. So, but they were unbelievable, you know, the... Um, when the funeral was announced, uh, the um, uh, the Leinster staff and players said, oh, we're coming. I was like, well, you've not really met my dad. You don't need to. It's only a tiny little church in the middle. No, no, we're coming. They came. They flew from Dublin to Manchester. They drove from Manchester um, up to uh, a tiny little village, you know, stayed at a travel lodge. They came to the funeral to support me and my family, um, and they did it back in return in the middle of a, a rugby week. It was amazing, amazing, really. Um, and uh, I did the eulogy. Um, so we had a conversation um, as a family about it. And um, my brother, who's, who's older, um, he said, listen, you're more used to doing these things. And you talk about leadership and, and wanting to do the right thing and say the right thing. Well, I remember, um, I remember the last time you were here, you talked about um, the, the O2 before the World Cup and how, you know, take that, we're there, and the songs. And yeah, like, yeah. I guess, in reality, that's preparation for this, right? I don't know how you prepare. I mean, I don't. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, oh, I don't. Think it's impossible to prepare for something like that. But the one thing, bit of advice I would give is, I normally would stand in front of people and speak without notes um, or with brief notes. On this occasion, I wanted to do it just as I wanted to write out what I wanted to say and the way I wanted to say it. So I did, and that actually was such a heartbreaking thing to do to talk about the memories of your father. And I talked about the seasons in the in, a, in, in the year and how it changed on a farm, so what winter felt like on the farm. You know, we used to have uh, dairy cows, and my dad would be at the heart of that, and then spring would come and the lambs would be born, and then we'd have summer, we'd have the harvest, and then we'd have the autumn. And I talked about the circle of life, and I tried to relate it to my dad's life and everything else. It was a strong farming community, so we had, um, the church was about 100 and... I think you could probably get 150, 170 people in it, but there were hundreds of people outside as well, and this, it was flashing down with rain on this bleak September day. Um, but um, I'm so glad I did it. So glad I did it. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt I told the story of his life um, the way it should be remembered. Uh, and, um, and then I went back to Leinster, um, and I got on with the day job. Yeah. But, you know, you talk about leadership, you know, I, you know, I came back and you can't help but think about, you know, the what ifs and if I'd spent done this and done this, but, you know, it's, 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 it was a tough time, a tough time, and, uh, um, but uh, the support I got was incredible, really. That, that, the is it worth it thing, I think, is the thing that um, everybody wrestles with, right? Because um, you do miss very key moments of your kids' lives at various stages for work. Like the, the work that we do is very shift-based, so you're gone for mornings or evenings, depending on what show, or you're gone for weekends. And, you know, if there's a show on 
and there's a birthday on, you have to do the show unless yeah. you use one of your holidays. And yeah, sure, you, you probably can. And ultimately, you get to realize I'm taking a holiday because it's my kid's birthday and I'm taking a day, a day off. But that's definitely something that I think you have to understand if you are going to ask people to do things like that there are sacrifices that they need to make. Yeah. And you need to be aware of the, the impact that you're having on people's lives when you're asking them to work out of hours or to do extra things. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, it's a choice. It's a choice, really, that you make. And that was the point I wanted to make at the Pinion Summit. You know, you can, we can all... You don't have to go down a leadership route. You know, you can, you can go down a managerial route or a, a functional route within an organisation where you can work nine to five and have your weekends free and not take calls and not have any responsibility to do with, you know, the leadership of the business or the organisation. But... Um, where would the world be if people didn't show leadership? Be my point. You know, so some people need to stand up, and we might be exactly where we are at the moment. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it's true. Exactly. <laughs> we might be standing on the precipice of disaster yeah. and, and multiple fronts. That's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, but um, I did have a slight political point made in my thing about uh, Brexit, but uh, I'll probably not say that. No, I'll go for it if you want. No, it's, uh... no, no, you're okay. You're okay. <laughs> Boris Johnson was on the day after me. That was I know, yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say, I hope you were getting the 53 grand that he was getting. No, well. no, no, I'll give him the zip. Uh, for the yeah. pleasure. But, um, uh, but no, it was, um, uh, you know, I, and that's the point I was going to make the audience is that, of course it's worth it, but just, just get the balance right. Yeah. But we need people to lead and we need people to inspire people and we need people who are going to motivate people because people ought to be want to work for organisations who are led well and they're cared for and they feel like they can be inspired by that person who's going to show the vision for where we're going to go and the reason why we're all going to work hard for, for this company. Yeah, okay. I've got to take a quick break. Uh, stay, stay tuned. It's uh, episode one of the second season of Leaders' Questions with Stuart Lancaster. We'll be right back after these. Welcome back. You're uh, listening or watching the second season, first episode of Leaders' Questions with Stuart Lancaster. Stuart, we're talking about a, a bunch of stuff before the break there, um, and one of the things that I, I kind of wanted to delve into a little bit more was um, just that whole kind of sense of uh, an, an organisation and, and how you need to be aware of what the, the reality of, of life is for people. And you also said something interesting about... Um, uh, people can decide to be either managerial or leadership. And it's a subtle enough distinction that a lot of people might not have picked up on, but you can be a manager and you don't have to be a leader. Um, explain a little bit about that for us. Yeah, well, if I um, take my career um, with England rugby as an example, um, there were a lot of managerial things I needed to do. So by that I mean the organisation of the week, the organisation of the skip the month, the planning ahead to the World Cup, the... Uh, communication with the media or whatever else, you know, that they're managerial jobs, I think, that, that involve some responsibility, but um, they don't involve a huge amount of top-end decision-making where you're making critical decisions whether to go this way or that way, you know. Sometimes you have to make decisions, not just on selection decisions, you have to make judgments on the values, you know, the values of the organisation and do we want to condone this or support this or whatever. <clears throat> um, leadership is also for me about being inspiring and being uh, forward thinking and planning and, in, and showing people what a vision of the future can look like. So, and some people don't want to go into that place. You know, they're quite happy, you know, being supportive, being, you know, and that's brilliant because I, had, I worked with some brilliant managers um, uh, at the RFU um, who were fantastic in, in everything they did. But it also meant that they didn't have the extra responsibility that leadership sometimes entails so they can then, you know, almost park the day job at the weekend and then but when you're a leader I think it's pretty much all consuming and you've got to make a conscious decision and I I you know my time with England I reckon um, probably because I didn't have a general manager I should have had a general manager who could take some measure I, I end up probably doing managerial jobs 40% of the time leadership 40% of the time and coaching 10% of the time um, whereas at Leinster um, I'm probably now 50% coaching 60% coaching 40% leadership and very little managerial responsibility because Guy used to be in and Leo do yeah. do all that stuff. So that's not to say they don't lead as well, but you know that they that's how their yeah. their division is. So I think it's yeah it, that's what I want people to understand the difference between leadership and, and managers. And uh, um, uh, there's no right or wrong. It's just whatever whatever you want to be. And but as soon as soon as, as, soon as you go into a leadership position, you're going to make decisions. And someone said to me, uh, once you decide, you divide. <laughs> And you can't be popular all the time, and it will, you know, um, creep into your 
your your life off the field as well, or, or your family life and everything that goes with it. Yeah, and uh, understanding that and dealing with that is again something that you would hope that people get better and as experience finally begins to mean something. Yeah, yeah. I think I think. What have I got better at? I've got better at um, not taking work home when I'm at home. I think I'm better. I'm better at that. Um, uh, better at not taking responsibility for everything. I think I, you know, I was probably guilty of that. Probably trying to uh, not taking defeat personally. Like, you know, we'd lose a game, and I'd, I'd think, right, what could I have done better? You know, and, and obviously, I'd still take it personally, um, but. I can let it go a little bit better. And maybe it's easier because I'm not coaching my national team and I wasn't in, you know, that's a pretty big responsibility when you're in charge of your own country. You know, when you lose the game, it feels like the world has ended. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if Leinster were to lose a game, obviously I'm disappointed. It's not, probably not the same context. But, but even then, I still, I'm still pretty grumpy when I go home if we lose. That's um, fair enough. <laughs> um, I, I did want to talk to you about, um, since the last season, uh, the New England Patriots have come back and, and won the Super Bowl with Bill Belichick as their coach. And I've made this point, and I'm not sure if I made it in the first season, but we in this part of the world have a very uh, binary culture. You succeed or fail, and if you fail, you're a failure forever, and you're kind of scarred with it. Uh, Bill Belichick famously failed with one of the greatest coaching teams that has ever been assembled in any sport, if you look at the subsequent careers that they all go and have at his, uh, during his time at the Cleveland Browns, they, you know, they, become a, a, they have a terrible season and the team actually moves after they uh, sack Belichick. But here he is, the greatest coach, potentially in any sport. Certainly he's, he, he, you could talk about him in those terms um, if, you, you know, if we need to deal in absolutes, but he's certainly one of the greatest coaches in any sport of all time. Failure is really important. It's a really important aspect of life that we should, certainly in this part of the world, I think get much better at dealing with and having a discussion about and, and teasing out, honestly, why didn't that work? Yeah, yeah no, I agree 100%. And I think um, you put me on the book, actually, the uh, Michael Lombardi one. Yeah. Um, and he talks about second chance coaches. So in American football, they tend to go for coaches who failed before in order to um, give them a second chance because actually they're going to be far better second time around. Um, uh, whereas, you know, obviously in the... In Europe, it seems to be that once you fail, then that's it, you're out the door and let's get the next person in. So, yeah, I think there's a huge amount to be said about giving people uh, opportunities once they've failed um, because they learn a huge amount. But also, the second thing is, yeah, the actual mechanics of what actually did happen there and what can we learn. And that's, that's the basis of the, um, the Black Box Thinking book, Matthew Syed wrote, um, which is about um, the black boxes in aeroplanes where they... They find the black box and they have a rigorous review of why the plane crashed or whatever happened um, and uh, why they're so robust mm. uh, in their review process. Whereas there's other, other organisations, sporting included, who would say, well, actually, that was just a terrible experience. Let's park that and not take the lessons from it. So, yeah, there's a huge amount to be learned from, from failure, there's no doubt. Uh, are we getting better at dealing with failure and learning how to... I mean, because, you know... You're in a professional environment now where you will lose games as rarely as that happens, but like the the review sessions have to be as rigorous. I mean, maybe it's built into professional sport in a way that isn't to, to other industries that you have to have that kind of constant analysis. Yeah, I think it is. I think I think you're right there. I think I think it is built into sport. You have to, you know, you play on a weekly basis. There's no team that wins all the time. You know, Man City Liverpool top of the Premiership at the moment. You know, they lose big games all the time. Um, not regularly, but they do. Um, you know, at Leinster, we're lucky. We've had a good season so far, but we've still lost games. And, you know, you learn as much from them uh, than you do, you do the victories. So it, it is in built in sport. Um, and I do think business can certainly learn from sport in that regard. Um, you know, we would always rigorously review every game. And some teams I've been in maybe don't do it as well as they could have done. But I think certainly at Leinster, we're, we're pretty hard um, on those. Uh, on those moments. Yeah, okay. There was a, a bunch of other things that I did want to talk to you about that kind of came up in the um, first season. People were wondering about managing millennials and it seems patronising to be, uh, you know, two men in their 40s talking about managing millennials but it's certainly something that came up. It, it like... I think that um, this is the type of thing that so the millennial uh, definition is a person reaching adulthood in the 21st century, uh, a.k.a. Generation Y, 
Um, so I'm born, <coughs> born late 80s to mid 1990s. Um, I remember uh, being a Generation Xer and being a little bit annoyed with how we were covered by the media when I was 18, 19. So I can only imagine how annoying it is for millennials to listen to a bunch of uh, footy duddies talking about them. But there, there is, you just have to be conscious of the fact that, like, um, talking to people changes over a period of time. There used to be a methodology in, in business of uh, the central repository of information was the boss and then everybody did what they were told. Uh, that is a work culture that will not survive today and is actually not one that is fit for purpose. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking that the, um, the millennials I, I coach are brilliant, They're very well grounded, very well brought up and there's no, no issues with any, any of them. But certainly how they consume information, how they learn you know, is, is, has changed, you know, so I would use WhatsApp as a big, big vehicle to, to communicate with them. Um, and uh, say, for example, um, they've played a game and they're not available to come to the review, they're maybe going to camp or whatever, I'll, I'll go through the review and I'll WhatsApp, I'll talk over the review and I'll WhatsApp it to them and I'll stay connected with them, you know, virtually, yeah. so to speak. Um, and I think they appreciate that, that form of communication. Um, uh, when that when when you realised you had to do that, was that like a no big deal, or was that a ooh this is different? I no, to... it, it was no big deal. I think mainly because my kids are seventeen and eighteen, so I've I've sort of watched them go from you know cute little you know babies to like nine ten years old, and you know what, when you get them the first phone, you get them the first phone around eleven, twelve, thirteen, whatever. Then suddenly they've got access to the internet, and and suddenly the whole th the whole thing changes. So we've had to adapt our parenting style. Yeah. Not particularly successfully, if I'm being honest. Um, but um, no, no, we've gone okay, but it, we've had to, definitely had to adapt as parents to the change in our kids as they've gone from 11 to... So Sophie was born in 2000, Tom was born in 2001. Uh, so we've done that to change how we've... And that's actually helped me become a better coach because... I've had to do it with my own kids. As in your WhatsApp and your kids here. Well, do, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. How you, you know, Snap, I mean, I'm on Snapchat. Right. Um, uh, <laughs> only with my wife, my son, and my daughter, because yeah, I used to send a text message, and they were like, What are you doing? No one sends text messages. Yeah. Nowadays, Dad, come on. So, I, you know, they'll reply on Snapchat. Um, so, yeah, but, but you've seen that change in personality and how social media changed them and how they communicate. And, you know, now we pick our moments to, to talk. We know they need to have their sort of. Not digital time, but you know, like I mean, they're, they're eighteen now, so you're not going to take the phones off them. Um, um, but um, uh, we we had to adapt our parenting. There's no doubt. Yeah. Um, from the way I was brought up, and that's definitely helped me become a better. Um, well, it, I think coach it, yeah. of people of that age. Well, it's a good point about the like if you're talking to people in. I mean, I, I presume there's no phones in team meetings, but no. um, you know, if people are still outside in their heads. Uh, like in whatever digital conversation is going and they're not focused on the actual team meeting then so we we have phones in, in meetings and it's uh it can be you know a little bit infuriating <laughs> sure i mean i used to yeah i used to be I remember, I mean, we don't we don't have that obviously luckily at leinster because you're in a team meeting and you've not got your phone in there you're watching the screen which is reviewing the game yeah and you're listening to the coach but yeah, I remember working in the RFU and people have their laptops up and you're chatting away in a meeting, they're tapping away and they're just, you know, they're not even listening. Yeah. You know, and uh, so yeah, I would be reasonably um, strict on that if I was in that sort of workplace, that's for sure. Um, but, um, but no, the, the only, I, I don't really notice it um, uh, at Leinster um, or in, in the teams I've coached. Um, the only thing I notice is sometimes how they can be affected by social media commentary. You know, so previously you used to be able to protect the players from, you know, what people would say about them by saying, right, well, don't put the newspapers in the team room. Yeah. But, you know, that's, that's, those days have long, long gone, you know, not only every newspaper's online, every platform's online and, and every person's on Twitter and Instagram giving a commentary on the whole thing. So. Yeah. So they need to be careful, and I try and educate them on that, um, and, that, and try, that protect, try and protect them. But that, that evolves too, right? That evolves to the point where, you, you know, sometimes people are going to be sucked in and spend a day or two reading the stuff, and other people are going to be strong enough not to look. Yeah. But it, it, it is a flashing light in the corner with your name on it, yeah. and you are kind of drawn towards it. So, but, 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 but that's where leadership comes in, because ultimately what you're trying to do is to, you're trying to influence their behaviour to go away from stuff that would probably not help them to things that will help them. Yeah. And I use my own 
personal experience of, you know, I could have read every paper after the World Cup, but probably wouldn't have been a sensible thing to do. I definitely wouldn't be going on Twitter. Yeah. Um, or anything like that. So I try and say to them, listen, I've been through this, and there is a way to get through, you know, a non-selection or a poor performance for Leinster or for Ireland or whoever it is, you know, and it's by concentrating on being very, very good at doing what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? Getting back on the horse, you know, let's make sure we work on the areas you need to improve, um, et cetera, et cetera. This bit over here is a complete, not a distraction. You know, it'll take you away from that. It'll actually make things worse. So that's my, my ways to try and influence influence their behaviour towards something that's going to help them improve. And there's never a case for a little bit of it just to kind of show you how toxic this would be and maybe try and turn that into a positive? You, you don't believe uh, that? I don't really make reference to it because I don't want it to become such a big issue. Um, you know, the everybody, I proved that person wrong or I, nobody believes in us, that whole thing. Do you believe in that motivation at all? No, not really. I, I think it's a pretty negative. It, it, it does work. I've seen it. You know, the prove people wrong yeah. mentality. You know, it's the sort of push-pull motivation um, and I'm more about you know think what it would mean to your family and friends for you to be successful think what it would mean to um, you know um, the team for us to achieve success this season or whatever imagine what it would feel like to be in the change room at the end of the game you know when we've got a few beers and you know da 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 and we've got a trophy sat in front of us imagine what that would feel like rather than You've just shut that journalist up over there, or you've yeah. that guy on social media. You know, you've proved him wrong, haven't you? You know, I think it's, you know, it's hard to do. It's easy to say and hard to do, but but it's definitely, you know, I'm much more for the power of setting them a vision about what they can achieve rather than the prove people wrong thing. Yeah, so and that, I, I mean, I think I was asked after the Champions Cup, is this redemption for you? And I went, no, not really. It's 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 a thank you to all the people who stuck by me, uh, and to thank to Leinster for the opportunity. You know, I didn't, I didn't do it. You know, there are a lot of people who said things, you know, um, that I know they said, um, but that wasn't what was driving me to achieve. It was, we'll go back to the conversation about my dad and it was for them. That's what drives me. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, a little bit of ha-ha-ha at the end. Is a, <laughs> it's a natural human, it is a natural human thing, right? It, it is, it is, it is, yeah, but um, it shouldn't be the motivator. No, okay, fair enough. It, I mean, it, I guess that's part of the, the uh, soup that makes human existence so interesting um, and being able to deal with that I think is definitely something that will come up over the series. There was a couple of other things that I wanted to talk to you about. I know that you're, um, you're starting to publish some leadership stuff on YouTube and also on, on LinkedIn um, so you're happy to share this stuff. It kind of, it's, not like, uh, it's not like you're protecting it and kind of keeping it. It's like a <laughs> well, there's a bit of a story behind it. Um, so obviously you know, we have these leadership podcasts and I, I've never been on social media at all in any capacity. Uh, and then I thought, well, I'll go on LinkedIn. And no one really knew I was on LinkedIn, so um, I got a few sort of requests, and maybe I had 100 people who I knew. And probably people who I wanted to connect with, to be fair. People also who I'd met, who I sort of sent a connection to. So this sort of grew from 100 to, say, 200 or whatever. And then we did our um, leadership podcast, so I thought, well, I'll share those to, just to my connections. And I did a couple of talks, and I said, I've, um, I've got these things that you can access through my LinkedIn page if you send me a connection. And suddenly I got another 100, and then another 100. Um, and then uh, a year or so ago, I set up a leadership club online. Um, and basically, I created um, 30 different 10-minute presentations on, uh, on leadership, ranging from building a leadership philosophy, to building your credibility, to what is emotional intelligence, to communicate, to inspire, to whatever. So all that stuff I'd learned, all those books I'd read, I've basically put it all into, say, a three-slide PowerPoint. I talk over the top of it, and it creates a ten-minute whatever. So the idea was, um, and I did a coaching club as well. So the coaching club would be um, uh, ideas on rugby drills and skills, and et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> um, but it needed... Um, um, publicising and, you know, marketing on social media. So I got a website and I got it set up um, and then I actually quickly realised that I'm actually rubbish at that <laughs> publicising. So, so it was actually costing me money for this website and I didn't, and, you know, you'd sell, I, the idea was you'd sell a package and then people would get access to the content. You know, it wouldn't be a huge amount of money, but 100 quid, say. Um, you know, 10 people buy it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, build it that way. Anyway, so... 
I could give a conclusion that in order for it to be successful, I was going to have to actively ma market myself, which I wasn't keen on doing. So I binned the idea but kept the content. Um, and then, uh, obviously, as the LinkedIn thing grew through the podcast that we did last year, um, I'm now on like 1,800. Very good. Um, so it's grown. Uh, so I've now said, right, I'm going to put out a t uh, one of these 10-minute presentations once a week for the whole of this year. So I've got 30-odd, 30-odd, 40 weeks. Uh, so, so that's what's happened. So I think I'm on module two, part C or something. Um, so I then make it available to my... Uh, LinkedIn connections only. And what I think I'm going to do at the end is, I don't really understand LinkedIn, if I'm being perfectly honest. I think there's, you've got your connections and you can make it public. So at the moment, it's going to my connections only. Um, so, and it's obviously up to them whether they listen to it yeah. or not. Um, but at the end, when it's all online on my LinkedIn, I'm probably going to go right on public platform and say, listen, there's 30 presentations here on leadership. If, you're, if you've got time in your hands, have a listen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Not a very good uh, business venture by me, really. But, uh, but uh, anyway, it goes back to the point about sharing what I've learned. Yeah, in fairness, uh, I mean, you are busy with your day job, so it's... Uh... Yeah, and I've done the work. So why, why, why leave it sat there and not, not share it? Yeah. There was one other thing that I wanted to ask you about. We saw a picture um, of Alex Mack, the centre from the Atlanta Falcons at uh, Leinster Training recently. You, you are very interested in learning from other sports and kind of dipping in and out from, from what you can get, as, as people will realise over the course of the rest of this season. Is there anybody in particular you've been talking to just recently? Kind of well, he was very good. Picking I mean, the brains yeah, Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, he, 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 he is a Dublin um, girlfriend, and uh, so he was in Dublin and... Uh, he wanted to come to Leinster's training. Obviously, I quickly put two and two together and realised I'd met him at the Atlanta Falcons. So he was um, he was great to come in and speak to the players. And you know, 140 kg, six foot two. You know, loose head prop, possibly. You know, we have to persuade him to give up his 45 million dollar <laughs> contract. But uh, uh, but no, he was great. He spoke about you know. I asked him three questions. What you've worked with many players. What the, what is it the best players have, and the ones who make it. And he said um, he has uh, rookies come in without their notebook to meetings, and he skips in the rookies. How do you learn when you're not making notes? He, he described how he would um, bring his book, and he'd write notes every meeting and star stuff, and he'd write his game plan down and everything else, and that's how he'd prepare for the game. And He talked about mental and physical reps in the week. He wanted to do enough mental reps and physical reps so he could be ready for the... I mean, this is a guy who's played at the top of the game for 10 years, hasn't he? So he talked about the Super Bowl... Um, what happened when they lost? Why they lost? What happened the following year? Um, so he, he, you know, he was a great example. But um, you know, I'm very lucky in that I'm still attached with um, different organisations, both in the UK and in Ireland now. Um, so whether it be business or leadership, um, there's been various things I've done with um, companies or leadership talks or whatever. But also, so like I'm on the board for the FA Football Association uh, in England. So I'm actually going down this week. Um, they've got an advisory board, and it's all about coach education in football. How can we improve, improve that? Um, I met, <coughs> excuse me, um, I met Gareth Southgate um, probably about three or four weeks ago. Um, I did a work for UK Sport, which obviously they're the ones who drive the Olympic bid. I did the same for the Irish Olympic Association, and all the sports are associated with that. Um, you know, the list goes on really of you know organisations um, in sport. And, and in business that, that uh, are interested in sharing leadership stuff. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens uh, at the end of the season, but I promised myself I'll try and have a holiday as well this time. Yeah. On the whole, you know, get the balance right theme. Um, I think last year, you know, we finished the Pro 14 final and we're three weeks off. I think I did a couple of leadership talks. I did a coaching seminar in Bristol to about 100 odd coaches. Um, and by the time I'd done three or four of those, I was like, hmm, I'm back in pre-season now. Mrs. Lancaster's looked me going, that wasn't much of a break, was it? Um, so I'm going to um, try and get the balance right. Yeah. Preach, uh, practice what I preach. Older and wiser, I think. Is that <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Or divorced. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, <laughs> I, I hope everybody enjoys the second season. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be great. We've got some great guests lined up. So yep. um, that wasn't a bad start, Stuart. Thanks very much. No problem. Thanks. Next week on Leaders Questions with Stuart Lancaster. Take you back a little bit. I think the biggest learning the Crusaders got, Stuart, was the British and Irish Lions defeat at mm. home. I think the philosophy and the way they viewed rugby changed that night. Did they expect to win? 
Uh, they, oh yeah, they expected to win, but I think it was more the manner of the defeat yeah. and essentially they couldn't score and couldn't, couldn't break down the defence. Yeah, clear definition of 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 how you played the game in terms of like um, you know what I mean. So a, a winter game and a summer game in terms of the ratio of um, you know what I mean rock to kick. So in your own half, like in Super Rugby, sometimes you just play a ball mm. and then kicking becomes a last resort. But I. Uh, what they learned from that night basically was in winter and June when it's um, really difficult. You know what I mean? You want to be kind of having minimal two to three rocks and clearing mm. having your exit strategy. 